hello. I'm going to talk about, as uh, Thomas said, we are, we are going to talk about uh, the blockchain as a platform and ecosystem with a focus on a uh, little bit on Bitcoin, Bitcoin and uh, BitShares um, with a few in-depth cases. So to start off, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Bitcoin to those of you who don't know about it. I suppose, have you heard of Bitcoin? How many in the in the room? Okay, so you've heard of it. Do you know? Would you say that you are into Bitcoin? Well, a little bit less people. So I'll see if we can do something about this today. Um, so um, the start of Bitcoin was in 2008 when uh, a person or a group by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto uh, released a white paper describing a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Um, so you can see the vision of Nakamoto was to, to introduce a peer-to-peer -peer payment system uh, that uh, does not rely on centralized authority that uh, allows a direct transfer value from person to person. Um, so here is a depiction of Satoshi Nakamoto creating the blockchain technology. He's kind of a wizard and he's a bit mysterious. Nobody knows who he is or she or they. He disappeared in the early days of Bitcoin, um, probably because he didn't want to be a target from uh, law enforcement. And that is one of the strengths of Bitcoin, that it's a decentralized system, it's not run by any company or, or entity. So it's very hard to shut down. So some facts about Bitcoin, it's open source code. It was released in 2009. Uh, it's actually a quite revolutionary technology. It combines cryptography and peer-to-peer -peer communication. Uh, and uh, in the white paper, Satoshi solved uh, a problem which has been discussed in information science for quite a long time. It's, it concerns how to solve decentralized consensus, how to achieve decentralized consensus. Um, Bitco I'm not going to go too deep into the details of Bitcoin, you'll have to look that up. But uh, it's basically a system where the coins are created by uh, computers solving arbitrarily difficult uh, problems and receive uh, bitcoins in return. Um, and these miners, they also decide which transactions will, will be accepted and, um, and which code is, uh, is an, the right code, so to speak. And that is a very interesting problem to solve, that you can now know exactly which code is uh, running, actually running in the network. Uh, yes, there's... Okay. Okay, I can repeat the question, it's an interesting question. How fast can you achieve consensus? So the block time in Bitcoin is uh, 10 minutes uh, approximately. So after 10 minutes, the network has uh, achieved the consensus on the next block, which includes uh, a lot of transactions. Um, and depending on the value of the transaction and the severity of this uh, decision, uh, you can decide how long, how many confirmations or how many blocks you want to wait before you can say that this transaction is irreversible. 
but generally six transactions, uh, six uh, uh, blocks, uh, which is approximately one hour, is considered to be extremely hard or almost impossible to reverse. So the original idea of Satoshi was that uh, you would have one CPU and uh, everybody would have their say and they would, you would mine and vote. But now it's a million dollar ASIC industry with uh, extreme uh, capacity the network now has for solving uh, the ex these exact uh, type of problems. Uh, it is. It was in 2013, I, I don't have the newest numbers, but in 2013 already it was eight times faster than the top 500 supercomputers in the world. So here you can see the logarithmic scale, the evolution of the hash rate of the network. So it's basically exploding. I mean, it's not useful for anything else but mining Bitcoin, but... Uh, numbers are impressive and it also means that it's almost impossible to do an attack where you suddenly bring in a lot of computing power it would require a a, a gigantic covert operation of uh, producing ASIC chips and it would be noticed by the network so in the years after Bitcoin was released a lot of new creative I would say copies or or uh, developments to Bitcoin have taken place. Uh, you have Litecoin, which is uh, number two, which is kind of the silver to Bitcoin's gold. Namecoin, which is uh, trying to create uh, an alternative DNS system, decentralized. Uh, Peercoin, which is a proof of stake system, which is a little bit different from the Bitcoin's proof of work, in that. Uh, it's not based on computing power, but rather the stake that you hold in the coin. And we'll get more into that on when we discuss bit shares later. But that was the first proof of stake system. And you have the internet memes are represented by the crazy people at 4chan. And yeah, that's actually quite a big coin right now, the Dogecoin. And it has a very, very active community. So there are thousands of cryptocurrencies now, actually. There is a, you can see the list online. Uh, they have varying degrees of value, but they have some value. And it's a, it's a field of, of uh, very fast development. You even have coin generators online. You can go and create your own coin for a small fee. So we anticipate there will be hundreds of thousands or millions of coins eventually when people just start doing this for fun. So, I'll just go through this quickly. Um, so the, the revolution here is that you decentralize the economy as the internet and the computer decentralized, the PCs decentralized computing and information. So the information was democratized with the internet, now the, the financial system will be democratized in the same way. That's our anticipation. Um, so basically anybody can transfer value to anybody else directly. And it has a lot of implications. Um, I will proceed. The time is running. So lately some uh, a new term has uh, emerged, which is called Bitcoin 2.0. Those are projects that try to do something more than just being a currency. Uh, you can say that Namecoin, which is quite an early coin, was uh, an example of that. But now you have more general systems like BitShares, where they develop a complete uh, platform to develop on top of. Ripple is kind of a mid middle middle ground between decentralized and centralized system used by a lot of exchanges today. NXT, it's a, a decentralized exchange built on proof of stake. 
You have MasterCoin, which is using the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, counterparty, which can be used on several different blockchains. Uh, and then you have the Ethereum, which is to date, I think, the most ambitious, which wants, they want to make a Turing complete processing platform. Uh, so basically a decentralized cloud computing. So I'll leave the floor to Christian now to talk about pictures. Okay. So I'm going to talk a bit about Bitchers. So Bitchers is one of these new 2.0 technologies and uh, uh, it's founded by Daniel Larmer, uh, who's a innovator. And you can see his mission was, uh, his mission in life actually is to find uh, free, free market solutions to secure life, liberty and property for all. So actually back in 2010, he was searching for a way to create uh, a currency and he stumbled upon Satoshi's solution. He discovered that somebody had already solved this problem and he wanted to uh, expand on it and uh, make further things possible. So as he says, if I'm successful, then society as we know it will operate on an entirely voluntary, therefore non-violent basis and governments will not be overthrown, they will become irrelevant. So he's ideolo ideologically motivated, of course, uh, Satoshi was as well. Um, but it's interesting that this kind of a revolution will not be uh, centralized, as they say. They will, um, they will try to outcompete existing centralized institutions like governments and banks and large exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange, so eventually Wall Street and many different things can now be uh, decentralized. That was not possible before because you needed some centralized trust in the system. So it's, it's a strain of huge ambition uh, coupled with his uh, love of cats. And <laughs> so he's innovating with the mission. So uh, life, property and liberty. What, how can we flesh this out in terms of the blockchain? So, first of all, you can think of uh, your extent, extended identity, so your passport or your identity, your bank identity. These are all uh, kept in private centralized institutions. And your sensitive information, your medical information, uh, somebody else is stores, can store this, and your card numbers, you're basically giving this away um, whenever you do uh, transactions with uh, eBay, Amazon, and so on. Whenever you buy something online, you just give away uh, your card information. And passwords, Google and Facebook, of course, uh, have a lot of, at least my information, my email. They have my identity. Facebook has a lot of information about my friends and so on. And I've basically just given this away to people. Uh, but with the decentralized evolu uh, revolution, we can start to reclaim our own keys, our own uh, extended identity, so to speak. And property, so shares, assets, funds, generally mediated now by banks and exchanges, and so on. And finally, liberty, transfer value freely without middlemen. So with the, in the rise of the internet, everyone in the world can now transfer information freely to everyone uh, in the world. But when you want to transfer value, you have to have a trusted intermediary. And uh, this is generally not a good thing because they take a cut and all this identity information and so on will, they can spy on you, they can, and so on. Uh, so we, we're trying to empower the individual to be free and independent. And the blockchain revolution will make these things possible. Uh, so just as a side note, I've studied philosophy and not something technical, so I'm mostly interested in the ideas and the implications of this technology. So uh, when we want to create this system, we have to also keep in mind the economic drive. So people can do things voluntarily for activism, for ideological reasons, but this is not uh, in the long term and for big applications. Uh, necessarily sufficient to usher in a new revolution. So, uh, to create new value, we should focus on 
economic freedom and economic efficiency. So freedom to express value, as I talked about, uh, value f flowing freely, uh, accurate price discovery, and channeling of resources to those who most deserve it. And this will create uh, value in the long run. And the blockchain, of course, as I talked about, will enable this kind of uh, freedom. Um, so I want to talk a bit more about this creation of value. So Daniel Larmer uh, wanted to create a decentralized exchange. This was one of the problems he saw in the Bitcoin space. You currently have Bitcoin, but around Bitcoin, all the money is flowing into the centralized exchanges because these are the areas where they can control people, they can invest, and they have power to know your identity and so on. So if you create a decentralized exchange, you open up the space to be more free and so on. So, but we want to have some kind of a metaphor to understand how we can create all these different type of applications that are possible with blockchain technology. So uh, we can think it is decentralized like Bitcoin, it's autonomous like Bitcoin, and with the company, we can think of it like a service. Uh, so, for instance, in Bitcoin, you have the service of transacting value. Uh, you have expenses and income. So expenses are the miners who process and secure the network. Somebody has to pay them. They're not doing this voluntarily, necessarily. Uh, and income. So whenever you transact Bitcoin, you have some transaction fees that are paid uh, when you send and this. Transaction fees goes to the miners who get paid. There's also a kind of inflation or dilution where new bitcoins are issued every 10 minutes, but this uh, will eventually flatline. It will be issued very few bitcoins eventually. So then you have to rely on transaction fees to pay the network. And the shareholders, you can think of bitcoin holders as shareholders in bitcoin. When bitcoin increase in value, uh, the shares in you have in bitcoin, of course, increase in value. And you've heard stories of these people who got a lot of value from investing in Bitcoin early. And I want to speak about one uh, analogy to properly understand the decentralized autonomous company metaphor. Because uh, imagine that you're an entrepreneur and you want to revolutionize some business. So the business is slot machine business. This is a company. It's an uh, autonomous company, basically. So it has two of the three properties there. You put uh, money into the machine, there are some rules that are processed, and then you get a reward, hopefully, if you're lucky. And, um, yeah, so it also has, uh, so it has a service, the service is gambling, the expenses are uh, like keeping the machine and running it and creating it and so on. And it has income because there's a discrepancy between what people put in and what they get out. There may be some commercials on the machine and so on. And it has share, there are shareholders in that company who wants this business to do well and so on. So when you decentralize this solution, which is what we can do now with blockchain technology, you have a traditional company, an autonomous company, a slot machine. And if you decentralize it, then you get a whole range of benefits. So you basically have a tr uh, an existing industry and you revolutionize it or you make it more efficient and better, basically. And because it's better, it will happen because some, um, some entrepreneur will do this and it will be easier for people to participate in the slot machine. So the benefits that apply to all DAX, uh, all decentralized autonomous company, are generally that they're open. So uh, Everyone has insight into how the rules are processed. Uh, everywhere in the world, people can inspect the code and see that everything is running as it should. When you have the centralized slot machine, uh, the rules are inside the machine. You don't have direct access. You have to break into the machine to see what's happening. And then you do something illegal. Uh, it's fair, so everyone has access. Everyone in the world can participate in this. And it's secure, again, because everyone has insight into what's happening. Of course, it's fast, uh, it's easy, and it's programmable, so you can update it in real time and so on. But Daniel Zalarmer's mission was, when he saw that uh, decentralized autonomous companies was possible, he understood that new industries are becoming possible. 
So he understood that he needed to create consensus technology that uh, that makes this uh, possible. So shareholder influence is important. We want uh, shares, the people who hold shares in the blockchain to have influence on the direction and who who has uh, certain rights in the blockchain. Uh, and economies of scale make it so that the Like in Bitcoin, when you have mining, and at scale, it's cheaper to process transactions. So you end up, it ends up not being very decentralized because uh, the more the more you centralize operations, the cheaper it is to process these transactions. Uh, so there's a uh, tendency in free systems to become centralized because this is cheaper. It's cheaper to do things in bulk. Um, and there's also a cost of decentralization, so for every extra node you add, there are processing costs associated with this. So we have to keep this in mind when we're designing the system. And delegated proof of stake will have uh, 101 delegates currently, but this is variable by shareholder votes. Uh, delegates are selected by shareholder votes, so yeah, instead of proof of work. So that's generally the proof of stake solution. Uh, at any point in time, only one delegate is producing the current block, so it's efficient. Transactions processed in 10 seconds or less. So, and it can scale to 10,000 transactions per second and beyond. So, Daniel Lamar wants to create an exchange. You can't necessarily put uh, Wall Street on, on the blockchain unless you have a very efficient blockchain, and that's what he has been focused on, making a scalable solution. And there are also some other properties of depots. You have delegates, uh, workers, and projects. So the shareholders can vote for different people, and they have an incentive to vote for the right people uh, to make the chain as profitable as possible. So you can have different kind, you can have a lottery deck and so on, and shareholders will vote for workers, and uh, it will be a system that directs itself. Uh, depots is a platform, so it's open source. Uh, promotes cloning, so we, which is basically wants everyone to create their own company. The vision is that it's completely decentralized, um, and soon it will always, uh, soon it will also try to be Turing complete, so within the year, probably. Um, so here are examples of depot stacks. So BitShares Decentralized Exchange, my brother will talk a bit about this in detail, technical detail. Uh, you have also Key ID, uh, Decentralized Identity Messaging and DNS. So it will try to compete with Namecoin, but we'll also have Identity and Messaging, which is important for social networks, it's talked about. Follow my vote, transparent, incorruptible voting. The having internet voting has been impossible, I'd say, before the blockchain. If you Google e-voting on YouTube, you'll find a thousand critiques of why it's not possible. But after the blockchain, well, it's possible. So play, that's kind of like, like the lottery case, but they create a, an open platform that anyone can create their own uh, solutions. And finally, pair tracks that I will talk about at the end is a new way to incentivize musicians. Uh, yeah, I'll talk about more about this later. So my brother will talk about Decentralized exchange. So, yeah. Okay. So, this is the flagship app, the flagship deck of uh, of BitShares. It's the decentralized exchange. It used to be called BitShares X, but now it's just called uh, BitShares, because it's the main application. Um, and it's a tough enough problem to solve. So, um, first, let's go through why, we de why do we need exchanges? I mean, basically, when I talk about exchanges, I now I'm talking about cryptocurrency exchanges. Uh, prior to that, I have no knowledge of exchanges. <laughs> um, so we need exchanges to get into cryptocurrencies, to buy cryptocurrency, um, mainly Bitcoin for most people. 
Uh, we need it. We need them when we want to withdraw our money or cash out to money that can be used everywhere, which Bitcoin cannot at the at the moment. If you want to take out dollars or Norwegian kroner or any other fiat currency, uh, when I say fiat, uh, everybody knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. No. Okay, so fiat is. Uh, uh, I think it's a Latin word for faith, which means that the fiat money is actually not market-driven. It's uh, not purely market-driven, at least. It's based on the faith of the issuer, uh, government. So in, in modern times, all countries have fiat money. Um, gold, for example, is not fiat. It's just based on... Uh, on uh, its properties as money. So, in that sense, uh, Bitcoin is much more similar to gold than traditional money. It's just a digital version of gold, which happens to be better than gold in every single uh, in every single way. I'm not going to get into that, although I would love to do that. <laughs> um, so. The main, the main uh, objective of uh, the exchange is, is for, to allow people to trade between fiat and cryptocurrencies. So it's kind of an interface between the new and the old. Uh, you can also trade crypto to crypto, but that is made extremely simple now. You have Shapeshift.io, which is a service that uh, algorithmically Change, uh, exchanges uh, cryptocurrencies with no middleman. It's an autonomous program run on a web server. So it can be done in seconds with practically no risk. So the, the, the fiat part represents the challenge when you want to move between fiat and, and uh, cryptocurrencies. So what is a centralized exchange? Do you guys know Mt. Gox? Have anybody heard of Mt. Gox? Anybody lose money on Mt. Gox? <laughs> One guy. Okay, I'm sorry to... to uh, I understand what you mean. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so what happened in Mt. Gox was that, well, a cent centralized exchange, you have deposits, you can deposit uh, bitcoins, you can deposit uh, dollars, and everything is done inside the exchange. This is a black box for the user. You insert money and they have your money. That's it. And there's an order book and all the services of the exchange are handled by one entity. So people who had a Bitcoin set Mount Gox, they didn't actually have Bitcoins. They had Gox Bitcoins, Gox BTC. And after I don't know if you know that, but uh, uh, Mt. Gox crashed in 2014. It was a huge disaster for Bitcoin. There was 750,000 Bitcoins lost. And to, to put that in perspective, the total amount of Bitcoin available at that time was around 13 million. 12 to 13, I'm not sure exactly, but 750,000 were stolen. So it was a huge disaster for Bitcoin. Uh, the publicity was bad, and it has a lot of people believe that this has contributed a lot to the fall in price of Bitcoin uh, in 2014. So after the crash, the, it emerged a market when they didn't know if Bitcoin, if uh, Mt. Gox would uh, reimburse their customers with the Bitcoins they lost. So what happened was that there was a market where Gox Bitcoins were traded for Bitcoins, and Gox Bitcoins were I think less than half the price of the bitcoins because it was, it, it had a risk associated with it, and in the end, people who bought Gox BTC lost because very few people got anything back, if any. So that's the centralized exchange story. So the problems are obvious, I think. Um, uh, you have had other, you have had uh, other. Uh, other uh, examples of exchanges failing, Mintpal, where the, the, the owner ran away with the money, Bater, Crypto Rush, it's like, uh, 
a lot of this happened after Mount Gox, actually, so people don't learn. Just keep losing money. So the problem is that you have to trust in the centralized uh, entity. Uh, there's a single point of failure, so, so there's one place to hack. Uh, you don't have transparency in a centralized exchange, and the user doesn't actually control their funds. They just trust that they will get them back. So a decentralized exchange works in a little bit different way. Uh, you need the order book mechanism. You have gateways for deposit and withdrawals. And as BitShares has solved this problem, you have two types of assets. You have user-issued assets, which are kind of Gox BTC, the trusted part, which you have to have when, you, when you're dealing with fiat currency or physical, physical assets even. It can be anything. Um, and the, then you have the bit assets, which exist on the blockchain and are trustless. They are secured by the blockchain in mechanism. So here we have a different, different system where bit shares, the decentralized exchange, the, all the trading goes on here. And you have bit euros, bit USDs, bit bitcoins, and bit gold. These assets they follow the, the value of what they represent. Uh, it's connected to the delegated proof of stake algorithm that Christian talked about. In the network, you have delegates that provide price feeds. Uh, and uh, well, so I'll get more into that. But basically, these are cryptocurrencies or 90% cryptocurrencies. They're very stable and they, they uh, they follow the, the value of their, their asset. And nobody can control them. You yourself are control, in control of these funds. So the only time you need to trust someone is when you send Bitcoin to the trusted gateway. Let's call it Gox. It's not very trusted, but let's call it that anyway. Uh, so what you get is uh, an IOU. And this represents the physic, the, not physical, but uh, the actual Bitcoin that Mt. Gox holds or Gox holds. And what you want to do is you want to, to quickly trade into one of these uh, trustless assets of the network. So you're basically only exposed to risk the moment you go in or the moment you leave the system. And the same for dollars. Um, so the user issue assets uh, are controlled by the gateway. They represent fiat, they can also represent anything. Uh, they can represent gold, they can represent uh, oil, they can re represent crops. Uh, basically anything you can imagine that you want to trade. Uh, they are subject to regulation. If, you, if, uh, if I accept Norwegian Kroner and uh, I put a uh, user-issued asset on the blockchain, then I may be required by law to be in control of this asset and uh, be able to freeze the asset if the law enforcement asks. Um, and I also need to know the customer. There's something called know your customer, uh, which means that you need to have an ID and you need to, to, uh, you need to know who you're dealing with. Uh, but that applies to the user-issued assets that represent this uh, traditional money. And there are a lot of use cases for this user-issued assets. Christian will get more into that later. So the bit assets, which is kind of the core invention, I would say, of the BitShares network. Uh, I'll go quickly through how they work. Uh, it's, it's not trivial, but... Uh, but basically, they are intrinsic assets of the BitShares platform. So it's a, it's a fundamental part of the, of the platform. Uh, it also represents the value of traditional physical assets, but it's, it, it's, uh, it, it does so by uh, using price feeds that, they, that it gets from the delegates in the network. All the delegates, the computers who run the network, 
uh, as Christian talked about, they are voted in by the shareholders. So it's a decentralized system with a finite number of uh, participants who are voted in. And they are uh, in charge of sending price feeds to the network. So that gives, uh, that gives a goal, a target price for the, for the asset. Uh, actually, the market handles a lot of this price finding mechanism. It works like a prediction market. People think that it will be worth something, then it is actually traded as such. And this system is up and running. They now have, uh, they have at least bit to USD dollars on the blockchain is very stable and is, is, uh, follows the value of real dollars very well, although it's uh, traded uh, in the free market. If it gets too far away from the, from the actual value, uh, then the, the mechanism will stop the, or they will buy up the, the, the assets. But that's, that's, that's technical. Uh, it's basically like uh, support rails on the side. If it goes too far out, then it gets pushed back. But uh, this is generally not necessary. Yeah, so the bit assets are actually created by two parties voluntarily uh, entering into a contract and they lock their bit shares as collateral. Uh, yeah. So here is an example. You have Bob who believes in bit shares. He locks down two dollars worth of his bit shares. Alice wants dollars. So she locks in one dollar worth of bit shares and she receives the bit USD. And if the bit USD price moves compared to the bit shares price, then the system will, will automatically buy up, uh, it will cancel the contract. So if the collateral starts becoming too small, uh, then uh, the system will automatically cancel the contract with in, in the market. It's very hard to describe this. Uh, I'm doing my best, but um, yeah, you, you should read about it. It's, it's very fascinating and it actually works. Um, so it can stand uh, very quick fluctuations in price. It, uh, it can stand uh, this in, the, in the order of 60% uh, uh, price movement in, in minutes or hours. Continuous. Uh, of course, if BitShares crashes, then everything crashes, but that's, that's how it is with all systems, including Bitcoin. Yeah, so here's the text version. I don't know, I have to, yeah, we're getting short on time, so I'll just skip this, unless somebody wants me to fill in something, if I can. No. Um, okay. So, I'll leave the floor to Christian. Thanks. So, uh, we started out with Daniel Larmer and his vision and the bitshare section and uh, we see this decentralized exchange and uh, it's pretty technical and you have to look into it to fully understand how it operates. You have to verify, verify it for yourself. So, everything is open source and you can see for yourself but uh, the basic uh, idea is, if, of course, to get the benefits. And uh, you get um, trust, or... Yeah, so uh, you eliminate the need for trust, so you don't have fraud and coercion. Uh, it's secure, so you're not exposed to theft, uh, unless you compromise your own keys. Uh, so you're basically, it's your own, up to your own uh, self to be secure. And it's transparent, so you have accountability, there's no insider trading. Uh, so identity, you don't have to expose your privacy, and you have autonomy. And the general improvements that I talked about are, of course, there. So we're creating value while securing life, liberty, and property for all, and increasing 
economic freedom and efficiency. So the decentralized exchange is perhaps one of the more important, but just one example of how uh, this technology can revolutionize society as a whole. So now I want to talk a bit more about these user issued assets because we've talked about them as as gateway um, IOUs basically, but they have other uses as well. So it's a really powerful idea. Uh, you can have uh, initial public offerings in the traditional way, or you can have a crowdfund with equity instead of perks or t-shirts or products. Uh, you can have token controlled access. So you can have uh, simple authentication. Uh, if you have, uh, for instance, thousand of a token, then you can enter in a building or you can perhaps get to a special place on a website. You can have complex authentication. You could have, if you have so and so many tokens uh, of different kinds, you can enter into different things. So there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, ownership tracking, property, assets. Um, but now I want to talk about peer tracks. So peer tracks is uh, one example of a decentralized exchange that I think takes it to the next level. So I talked about the slot machines, uh, relatively simple. And the exchange is uh, kind of fundamental, but this is more of a, a use case that uh, integrates all these different kinds of solutions. And you have entrepreneurs that are creating this because they think it's superior to traditional systems. So the front end of peer tracks uh, will have streaming, download, merchandise. Just to clarify, it's an example of a decentralized uh, autonomous company, not yes. an exchange. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it has uh, user issued assets and it has bit assets and so on inside, but uh, it integrates all these different solutions. So the front end will be normal, it, uh, like iTunes or Last.fm or Spotify, things like this. So it will have streaming, download, and merchandise. But it will have this special thing, which is artist coin. So this is basically a user issued asset, which is, has uh, a creative function in this, uh, this type of company. So at the back end, at the blockchain level, uh, you have this artist coin or token. So you can think of it in three ways. You can think of it like a baseball card or token that the artist has that will get value just because people tend to value things like this. Uh, you can have token control access, so you can have VIP pass. So the artist can say, if you have a thousand uh, JC coins, then you can get backstage on his concert. Uh, or you can do a crowdfund uh, with equity. So this, the artist can say that he gives away so and so many shares. Uh, so you can think of it like an artist share that he gives away uh, 10% and he raises money to create a new album. Uh, but basically, the primary function of this website is that it has this mechanism. So when you stream, download, or buy merchandise from an artist, uh, some of the fees that you use to buy this thing will go into buying up the artist coin. So it will automatically, on the blockchain level, buy up the artist coin. So this means that there's a correlation between the popularity of the artist, measured across these, and the value of the artist coins. So this means that uh, you'll have a sort of uh, price discovery of talent. So you have a talent discovery. So you, you'll have people who uh, know that an artist is undervalued, and they will buy up the artist share because they know in the future people will be uh, looking for this artist. And this platform will also have all the other benefits of the decentralized exchange. It's an integrated solution. So basically all kinds of decentralized autonomous companies that come in the future will uh, get more and more uh, benefits. So of course you have the same things. So benefits seen through uh, three different eyes. So you have the users who use the platform, established artists, and new artists. So for new artists, uh, they promote undiscovered talent. Uh, artists generally think that they have some talent. So they, they launch their song and they, they will think that they have talent. So they will want to go to a platform where talent discovery is actively promoted. Um, 
you're not screwing over lo loyal fans. So we saw in the Oculus case, if any of you donated, uh, they basically raised $2.4 million, and this is seen as like a, uh, an activist, or people donate because they like to support Oculus. And then Oculus gets bought up by Facebook for $2 billion, and you sit there with a t-shirt, you sit there with uh, an alpha edition of their software, and you basically get nothing in return. And I think this is a revolution that we will undergo it's a shift in mentality. Uh, we should get equity when we donate to companies and help them through tough times like this. Um, and this also applies to artists, of course. You know, Justin Bieber was discovered on YouTube. There were probably a lot of 13-year-old girls who supported him, uh, gave him good comments, and basically gave him confidence to grow to be as big as he was. And they get nothing in return, but if they could have bought a share in Justin Bieber, they would have had maybe been even millionaires. So you're not screwing over loyal fans with this type of a solution. For established artists, uh, you have creative marketing, you have a new kind of independence. Maybe you saw this thing where the artists are um, try to create this title.com. Uh, it was like Jay-Z, Beyonce. Alicia Keys, Daft Punk, there were a lot of high profile artists that tried to create this uh, exchange, but they had all their shares for themselves. And basically nobody's buying it. I think it crashed right after launch. No, Everyone understands that this, not, this is not the next level thing. And for users, you have free streaming, uh, talent discovery, of course, and users are incentivized to discover talent. You'll have a new kind of economy. Um, this is another DAC. We don't need to go so much into this. Basically, as I talked about before, you have uh, voting on the blockchain. So we have voter anonymity, and you can follow your vote. You can verify that you have voted as you should have voted. Um, and nobody can... Uh, you, have, you have privacy, but you can verify that you voted as you should. And this has been a general problem. And it's provably honest, incorruptible, just like all the other decentralized autonomous companies. Uh, so there's unlimited potential, key ID, Pictures is working on this, Pictures Play is another thing. Opportunities for entrepreneurs is, I think, is the main thing that's happening in the crypto space now. Uh, Pictures is open source, so you can fork it, you can copy it, you can create your own business. And you can also become a delegate in the BitShare system. You can get paid to, to participate in the BitShare ecosystem. And this will create a new decentralized kind of organization or community structure and so on. So, yeah. Okay. So I'll wrap it up, say a few words about us. Um, we are BitSpace. We are a group. The two of us. We're focused on Bitcoin and crypto 2.0. Uh, we are looking for people who are interested in what we do. Uh, we're not offering jobs, but we would like to work with people. Um, we're doing this as a hobby for now. Um, so visit us as, at bitspace.no. Send us some. Send us a mail. Tell us what you would like to see and if you want to join us. Uh, for specific projects, we are working on BitGate, which is a Norwegian gateway to BitShares. Uh, so if you want to start trading BitGold, BitBTC, BitUSD, or user-issued assets on BitShares, and you have Norwegian Kroner, then we might be able to help you. So if you want to get updates on that, Go to bitgate.no and sign up. We'll post you on our progress. So that's it for us. Now, if anybody has questions, we, can we don't have much time, but we can take, I think, two questions. Anybody want to ask a question? Yes. Hey. Um, 
I'm not really technical again, but um, there are some default that has appeared also with Bitcoin, and I'm just I, I don't see if uh, BitShares or those new 2.0 cryptocurrency are solving this problem, and especially the problem, the basic problem of scarcity. Like one of of the features of Bitcoin is that from the beginning you know that there is a limited amount of uh, money in in of uh, yeah Bitcoin in circulation, and that's when you when you go back to what is money and what's the need for money in society or a currency is just to balance contributions, but it doesn't have value in itself. It it doesn't have any value. It's just a when we trust th this way of exchanging. Uh, contributions, we use that. But creating scarcity from the beginning, then it can encourage speculations on money and it really disconnects money from real economy. So I'm, I'm a bit, uh, I, yeah, I, I see that as a default and I don't see if this is really answering uh, th that. Yeah. Uh, is, is there a question? Or do you just want me to comment on that? Yeah, I would like to have your, yeah, to, to see if this scarcity and speculation aspect on the money yeah. is solved in any way in BitShares. Well, uh, the way I see it, BitShares is uh, not actually money as such. It's a platform which has equity. Uh, BitShares itself uh, can decide how much inflation they want. Uh, the delegates can uh, can vote on the software which is running, and uh, so this is open to to change. Now about Bitcoin, I would say that uh, this is a feature of Bitcoin. And when you say that money uh, does not work with scarcity, uh, I would like to, to remind you that the gold has been working perfectly fine for uh, thousands of years, and it's only a parenthesis of history that we have used uh, money which is not scarce in that sense. It's actually one of the big main properties of money to be scarce. That's my view. But uh, there, are, there are many different views on that uh, question. Do you want to Yeah, I think, I think that's uh, kind of missing the point because this is going to happen. We're already seeing it happening. And if you if you look into the problems that it's solving, it's so fundamental. Uh, but I'm I'm pretty sure anyway that <laughs> this will happen and so on. So it's happening. It's being used as money, it, and it's being used by big actors. It's yeah. gaining a lot of momentum. But so I, yeah. So I guess one. Yes, but now Microsoft and Dell has entered the arena, and I don't think they are in it for the illegal activities. Well, yeah. actually the crowd crowdfunding in Bitcoin in 2014 was the same as the internet in uh, 95 or something like this. So you can see the parallels there. Yeah. At first the internet was just used for porn, so. <laughs> but now it's used for <laughs> legitimate purposes. Yeah. Our second and last question. Is there anybody with another question? Actually, I do have a small question. I think maybe you should explain Turing incomplete. I don't think everybody knows what that is. Why is that relevant here? Do you want to do that? <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, Turing completeness, the way I understand it, I mean, I'm not an expert in information science, but uh, uh, the way I see it is, uh, the way I understand it, it's, uh, it's, uh, related with uh, general computing. So you're able to, to solve any kind of uh, computational problem. Uh, that might be a simplified uh, answer. I think maybe uh, people in the room here might have a better grasp of this uh, notion. Uh, I think the basic idea is just, you have a universal computer already exists, so you want to have a decentralized universal computer. That's basically what they're trying to achieve. So then you can do anything that a computer can do on the blockchain. Then I say thank you to our speakers and thank you to everybody present.